The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you listen fairly frequently to this program... You've probably noticed several things about the commercials. They're interesting. They appeal to your intelligence. They help you solve personal or family problems. Tonight, for instance, the Equitable Society is going to present some very timely facts on why it pays to give your children a college education. We'll then outline a simple, workable, money-saving plan, the painless way to pay for those four years in college. If you want your children to get ahead in life, you'll be vitally interested in this information from the Equitable Society coming in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Vanishing Witness. The job of the professional law enforcement officer is never an easy one, for the war against crime is full-fledged battle. However, it is true that some criminals present less of a problem than others. Take the ordinary crime of auto theft, for example. In the past 12 months, almost 72,000 cars were stolen, representing a total value of more than $56 million. Yet the record also shows that more than 94% of those automobiles were returned to their legal owners, often within a period of 24 hours. Swindlers may enjoy momentary success, but the files at the Federal Bureau of Investigation reveal not a single important confidence man who has failed to serve at least one prison term. Go down the line, and you will find the same thing to be true with almost every type of criminal. However... There is one big exception to that rule. One kind of lawbreaker always difficult to arrest on the weight of evidence. Fortunately, he is not in every city in the country. The overwhelming majority of men in public office being decent, responsible human beings. But this leech among us, the politically protected racketeer, is present in too many sections of the nation. And where you find him, you will find crime on the increase with almost everyone profiting handsomely. Hoodlums enjoy steady employment. The criminal machine is kept well-oiled by a constant flow of loot, and the crooked politician is able to retire wealthy. Situation, one group composed of you, the people. Tonight's file opens in the corridor of a courthouse located in a large Midwestern city. Detective Roy Williams of the local police stands near the door of the grand jury room as FBI Special Agent Taylor approaches. Hello, Roy. Oh, hi, Jim. You come up to hear Caswell on the stand? Yeah. My agent in charge wants to see if there's anything in this case that'll give us jurisdiction. Well, I don't think there is, but stick around and listen. You'll enjoy it. Are you that sure? Yeah, yeah. That story about the race and why being a legitimate news service won't hold water this trip. No? We'll prove Caswell knows the service is going to bookmakers. How are you going to do that, Roy? Oh, we've got the big witness. Oh, and who's that? An old man named Onslow, who's Caswell's bookkeeper. Wow. Say, that reminds me. Hmm? Where is the old boy? He's supposed to leave the hospital a half hour ago. Hospital? Yeah, he's been sick, but the doctor okay is coming up here to testify. Oh, I see. Can I have a statement, Mr. Caswell? How about something to the examiner, Mr. Caswell? I'm sorry, boys. No comment. Oh, now, wait a minute. Can't you give me one quote? I'm sorry. Hello, copper. Well, look, how about a picture? What do we get inside? Hey, Charlie, over here with the camera, huh? He looks pretty confident, Roy. Yeah. Roy, Roy. Yes, Nick? We were just down to the hospital to pick up old man Onslow. Well, where is he? Two men posing as cops took him out of the place five minutes before we got there. The 
following morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor returns to his desk from the teletype room to find Detective Roy Williams waiting. Hi, Roy. You looking for me? Yes, Jim. I was in to see your agent in charge, and he put you on that missing witness case. You mean old man Onslow? Mm-hmm. Turns out he was kidnapped and taken across the state line. Oh. You got any idea where to? Well, only the direction. A friend of Onslow's called headquarters this morning to report he saw the old man yesterday on the Hudson Street Ferry. Huh. You come up with any ident on either of the kidnappers? None at all. I don't have to tell you, Jim, without Onslow's testimony, the grand jury can't bring back an indictment. Yeah, I know. How long do you think they'll wait? Till tomorrow morning. Uh, if we don't produce Onslow by that time, they'll start hearing another case. It's not much time. No. To make it worse, the term of this grand jury expires the end of this week. Well, you've covered the hospital, haven't you? Yeah, but I drew a blank. Wasn't there any police guard? Uh-huh. They took him out of the play. He was called to the hall telephone. But... Yeah, well, what about this uh, friend who saw Onslow on the ferry yesterday? Well, I got his name and address here on this sheet of paper. Let me see. Andrew Harper, 29 Maywood Street. Mm-hmm. You want to interview him, Jim? Yeah, sure. Hey, where are you going? Back to the hospital. Some of the floor workers who were on duty at the time of the kidnapping weren't due back till this morning. Oh, I see. I'll meet you back here at your office. <laughs> Good morning, Pearl. Hi. A little early for you to hit the office. Nah, I couldn't sleep. Stomach again? Yeah, it's murder. Every time there's one of these investigations, my ulcers start playing handball. You take anything? What can I take with grand juries, customers beefing? They've all been that? calling all morning. Why don't I go into a legitimate business? No, oh, that's another beef. I'm not here. Okay. Mr. Caswell's office. Is he there? Bill? Yeah. Hold it. Bill wants to talk to you. I'll take it on the other phone, huh? He'll be right with you. Hi, Phil. How's it going over there? No good. No good, huh? That's all I hear from everybody. Look, we've been working on the old guy for hours. You won't change his story? No. Nope. Put him on the phone. He's out cold. How much time we got? Hey, he's due on the witness stand tomorrow morning. I've got an idea. What's that? taking some pills they gave him at the hospital. They've run out. So? He claims if he don't get some more, he'll kick over. Oh. Should I uh, see if he's telling the truth? No, you better get him the pills. But you want him on your side. I want him on my side alive. Well, we'll go to work on him again. No. Lay off the muscle. What else is there? Yeah, I'll think of something. When I do, I'll call you. <laughs> I got a small lead at the hospital, Jim. What's that, Roy? The two phony cops signed the visitor's register. Oh? Here's the page with their signatures. What names did they use? Richard Jones and John Smith. <laughs> they used a lot of imagination. Yeah. Think your lab can get anything on these? Well, I'll have it checked for handwriting and latent prints. Oh, say, uh, mm-hmm. one of the elevator operators remembered bringing Onslow and the two men down. He said both kidnappers were tall and wore hats with the brims pulled very low. That's almost as good as a mask. Now, I showed Onslow's picture to every cab driver who works the line in front of the hospital, but none of them remembered him. Well, that figures. Not much point in taking a cab from the hospital with a ferry right across the street. Hey, how about the man you interviewed? Well, he said two men were with Onslow, but he couldn't describe them. The only details he recalled was that he was wearing slippers instead of shoes and that the ferry left here at 1.40 p.m. Yeah, those things might help if we had time, but... Only about half a day left. Yeah, Caswell's probably watching the clock, too. Yeah, except the deadline favors him. Yeah, I know. Oh, Roy, I checked with the ferry company. The boat that pulled out of here at 1.40 yesterday afternoon was the James Chris. You get it scheduled for today? It's due out again in uh, 20 minutes. Let's get on there, Roy, and take a ride. <laughs> I thought I had something for a minute. What's that, Jim? I just talked to the gateman down at the other end. He recognized Onslow's picture, but he didn't remember seeing anybody with him. Well, I didn't even do that well. Huh? Hey, look. Boat's pulling into the slip. Yeah. Well, I guess there's nothing left to do but take the next one back. All we managed to do was use up a couple of hours of valuable time. 
Hey, Roy. Hmm? You start us something. Come on. Where are you going? I want to talk to the yeah. shoeshine boy. Shoeshine. Yo, shoeshine. Okay, right with it. Shine, mister? Yeah, I'd like a shine and some information. Well, I'll do the best I can on both. Right foot first, huh? Okay. I'm a special agent of the FBI here in my credentials. Oh. Were you on this boat yesterday? Yeah, all day. Well, in your line of business, you generally notice what kind of shoes people are wearing, don't you? Most of the time. Yes, sir. Well, do you remember seeing anybody on this ferry yesterday who was wearing slippers? Slippers? Yeah, sure I do. He was an old guy. Take a look at this picture. Is that him? Sure, that's the guy. Do you remember who he was with? Let's see. Yeah, I think I do. He was with two other guys. I gave them both shines. One was wearing brown shoes, the other black. What they look like? Well, no, you can't do that. Now, would you recognize them if you saw them again? Yeah, I think I would. How about coming to police headquarters with us and looking through some pictures? Sure. Thanks a million. Roy, if he can make an eye dent for us, Onslow might still get before that grand jury in time. Have a chair, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Caswell. My secretary said you were with the FBI. That's right. Here are my credentials. Thank you, sir. Hmm? You don't mind if I look at them closely. No, no, not at all. You can't be too careful, you know. Take all the time you want. I don't have to be anywhere till 10.30 tomorrow morning. They seem to be in order. Now, what was it you wanted to see me about? About two men who posed as police officers and kidnapped a grand jury witness who was prepared to testify against you. Mr. Ronslow? That's right. Well, I'd heard he was missing, of course, but not that he'd been kidnapped. (laughs) That just shows you never know about these quiet little men. Who'd think he had enough money to be worth kidnapping? No, he's not being held for ransom. No? No. You see, we know who kidnapped him. Well, you FBI men are really amazing. You mean you already know who did it? The names are Phil Nolan and Paul Adams. Well, then you've got no problem, have you? All you've got to do now is find those men and arrest them. That's why I came here, Mr. Caswell. Well, I... I don't quite understand. It's common knowledge that both Nolan and Adams work for you. Nolan? Adams? Well, I don't think so, but just a minute. I'll check. Yes, Mr. Caswell. Uh, look at our payroll record, Miss Sheridan. See if we have anyone working for us named... Uh, uh, what were their names again, Mr. Taylor? Phil Newland and uh, Paul Adams. Oh, yes. Phil Newland and Paul Adams. Just a minute, sir. Maybe janitors or elevator men in some of the real estate I own, you know. No, I doubt that you'll find them in that category. Well, perhaps they work in my construction company. They're muscle men, Mr. Caswell. Muscle men? Well, I'm afraid Mr. Caswell. That uh, yes, Miss Sheridan. Neither of those names appears on the payroll record. Thank you. Well, there's your answer, Mr. Taylor. Caswell, let's stop kidding each other. You know those men work for you, and you know they took Onslow. You're the only one who'd benefit by his absence. Look, are you charging me with kidnapping? No, not yet. Any other charges you want to make? Not till I can prove them. Well, come back when you think you can. I will, Mr. Caswell. That's a promise. <laughs> a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children. Let's turn the calendar ahead for a moment to the year 1960 or 65, to a day when that youngster of yours comes to you and says... Oh, Dad, I'm all set. I passed my college entrance exams. (laughs) Yippee! Your boy has three good reasons for feeling on top of the world. First... College men and women earn more money. Look, Dad, in this morning's newspaper, it says college men earn $72,000 more during the years they work than the fellows who miss out on a college education. Second, college men land the bigger job. And listen to this, Dad. Out of every 16 men earning $10,000 a year and up, 15 are college guys. <laughs> That's odds to 15 to 1 in favor of college. Third, college men get more out of life. Their general culture, their appreciation of art and good books, gives them poise and prestige in their social life. Think that over, father and mother, and decide now that your children are going to have the big advantage of a college education. 
decide to make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? Why, what's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this equitable society plan, you start when your children are young. Then, each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt, an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college, the money's all ready for him. Yeah, that's spreading the cost of education over 10 or 15 years, instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled. Then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your equitable society representative show you how little it costs to start an equitable education fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Vanishing Witness. Every case chosen for dramatization on this, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has a message for you listeners, an important message. Take this evening's case, for example. It concerns the boss of a machine which controls crime in a particular city. There are probably some now asking themselves how this affects them, unless they happen to reside in just one place. Here is their answer. Look at crime for what it is an infection in the body of society. Let it fester unchecked in one place, and it spreads, as any epidemic will. The reason it spreads is that crime breeds dictators, and therein lies the menace to you, the decent citizen. No dictator, by the very nature of his position, can afford to sit still. Born of turmoil, he lives by chaos. He must reach out for colonies, for puppet states in a constant effort to expand. In like measure, the criminal dictator, established in one community, must spread out, must move to include new territories in his domain. Eventually, unless stopped, he reaches you. But those two words, unless stopped, do not constitute a careless, empty phrase. The Ed Caswells of the country can be stopped, as infection is by medicine. In the case of crime, the medicine is usually manpower. More manpower for your local police. Give them that weapon. Leave them politically untrammeled. And your police will do the job. Tonight's file continues later that evening at the local FBI field office. Detective Roy Williams has just entered. Did you get to see Caswell, Jim? Yeah, and that's all I did get. What happened when you hit him with Newland and Adams? Claimed he didn't even know them. I was afraid of that. Jim, do you realize we have only 12 hours to find the old man? Yeah, I know, right. And we don't even know if he's still alive. Oh, I think he's alive, all right. If they wanted to kill him, they'd have done it in the hospital. Boy, has uh, Onslow got any family? Well, no wife or children, but I gather there was a sister someplace. Hmm? Yeah, at least there was a picture in his room at the hospital signed your sister, Ethel. Is a snapshot or a portrait picture? A portrait, why? Well, maybe the photo studio can tell you who she is and where she lives. Right, I'll get it and start checking. Okay, and while you're doing that, I'll study Adams and Newland's records again and try and find a lead there. Well, what's with the jollies? Oh, it just happened to feel good. That was a quick cure. All I needed was a little luck, baby. Puts the ulcers right to bed again. Ah. The mail come in? Mm, it's right in front of you. Oh. Mm -hmm. Did the old man change his story? Not yet, but he's going to. How do you know? Well, I happen to remember old man Onslow telling me that he had a sister named Johnson. He gave me your phone number once, said if he wasn't home, I could always reach him there. So? So from the phone number, I got the address. I gave the address to Phil. He went over there this morning to pick her up. Do you mind very much if I don't get it? Phil brings his sister back to where he's keeping Onslow. If he doesn't testify my way, she gets the treatment, too. Oh. How have you been doing with our customers? They're still complaining. Well, just tell them to be patient. The horse will be back in use tomorrow. 
Did you locate Onslow's sister? No, I got an address from that photographer, but she'd moved six months ago. And no forwarding address? No, but the department is checking every moving company in town. Yeah. Well, I spoke to my agent in charge. He didn't think there was any chance of getting another continuance from the grand jury. I know there isn't. We either come up with Onslow in the next hour or else. Hey, Roy, wait a minute. I just got a thought. What's that? We know the kidnappers had their shoes shined on that ferry, don't we? Mm-hmm. Now, let's assume for a minute we're the kidnappers. Now, we, we spirit old man Onslow out of the hospital onto the ferry. Mm-hmm. Now, if we had a car, would we get out and take Onslow for a walk so we could get a shine? Well, no, of course not. Okay. Now, if we were taking Onslow any distance after we got off the ferry, we'd need a car on the other side. That's right. Well, in that case, it would have been just as easy for us to use a car all the way and a whole lot safer. Yeah. Wouldn't that make it seem that the old man is hidden out someplace close to the ferry slip just across the river? Could be, Jim. But that district is crowded with tenements and cheap rooming houses. It'd be next to impossible to find anybody in that jungle. We had days instead of minutes. Well, there's no point just sitting around here and letting the clock run out on us. I'm going to take the ferry and canvas the rooming houses, coffee shops, diners. I and... sure wish I had jurisdiction over there. Well, I'll get some local help. Oh, by the way, Roy, why was old man Onslow in the hospital? Some kind of blood disease. Do you remember the name? No, the hospital could tell you. Okay, I'll check with them. Did you get Phil yet? Operator's ringing him now. Now, how do you like the new wardrobe? Businessman blues. Looks a little square. <laughs> Sensational for juries, baby. Makes me a very legitimate fella. Hello? Hello, Phil. Ed wants to talk to you. I was just going to call him. Here's Phil. No. Hello? We got trouble, Ed. No, what happened? I went to the sister's house. I was crawling with cops. Oh. Well, I guess they got the same idea. They spot you? No, I drove right past. Did you tell the old man she wasn't coming? No. That won't make any difference, Ed. He's a stubborn guy. Well, I guess there's only one thing to do, Phil. Kill him. <laughs> Along here. Uh, pull past the courthouse. That's where I parked yesterday. Okay. I hope Phil followed through. You can depend on Phil. I don't know why you didn't kill the old guy in the first place. That's too crude, Pearl. Having him testify for me would have been much better. You'd think he'd have been willing to after having worked for me for so long. Well, I guess I expect too much from people. Oh, there's a spot to park. Oh, yeah. How am I on that side? Oh, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Now, where are those cancel checks? In the briefcase. What about the rent receipts? Yeah, they're in there, too. Well, okay, let's go. Here come those newspaper characters. Yeah, I see them. Got a statement to make, Mr. Caswell? Uh, not right now, boys. Oh, I got a deadline in half an hour. Well, I got one sooner than that. Can't you give us anything? Why don't you guys lay off? Now, honey, they're only doing their job. See me when I come out, boys. You'll have a good story then, huh? Okay. Ed. Huh? It's 10.30. Well, there's no rush. Look, they haven't even opened the doors yet. Well, there's the fuzz up ahead. Mm, I see them. Oh, well, hi, copper. Oh, hello there, Mr. Taylor. Well, you still look pretty confident, Mr. Caswell. Well, why shouldn't I? Take a look down the hall. Where? See the man talking to the city attorney? Onslow. Ed. Shut he... up. You thought he was dead, is that it, miss? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You want to tell him, Roy? Sure, sure. Your two thugs are at the city jail, Mr. Caswell. They just signed full confessions implicating you. What? You've got your choice, Caswell. You can wait around here till Onslow testifies, or you can come to headquarters right now. <laughs>
Ed Caswell, Pearl Sheridan, Phil Newland, and Paul Adams were all tried in federal court on a charge of kidnapping. Upon being found guilty, each received a sentence of life imprisonment. Tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation is another in the long line of illustrations of the value to every special agent of the course of training he receives at FBI headquarters in Washington before being sent to a field office. Part of that training teaches a student never to evaluate the various clues in an investigation, for the one which seems most promising frequently leads to a dead end, and the one which at first seemed just another useless bit of information develops into the lead with which a case is broken open. For example, Special Agent Taylor was able to locate the hideout to which Ed Caswell's kidnapped bookkeeper had been taken because before starting his search, he called the hospital where Onslow had been a patient. The doctor there informed him that the old man was suffering from acute leukemia, which was being treated through the use of newly developed pills containing aminopterin. The doctor also said he had written a prescription for the pills and given it to Onslow in case he needed some while away from the hospital. Special Agent Taylor then proceeded to the district where logic had told him Onslow was being held. A visit to the neighborhood drugstores revealed one which had had a call for aminopterin and had delivered the pills to a certain address, an address which turned out to be occupied by Phil Newland, Paul Adams, and their kidnapped victim. In that way, another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was closed, and a criminal dictator whose continued freedom had been a threat to every decent citizen was removed from circulation. But even more important, the life of an innocent person was saved. An innocent person who is now a living tribute to the fact that the special agents of your FBI are vigilant, tireless defenders not only of the liberties and properties of the American people, but also defenders of their very lives. Now one last word to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like, Thanks, Mom, and thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and that ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case from the past that has great application today. Its subject, robbery. Its title, The Black Market Hijacking. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Bill Conrad, Herb Ellis... Ed Gargan, Doris Nolan, John Sheehan, and Gil Stratton, Jr. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The black market hijacking on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of the Thin Man. Fun and excitement for the whole family when the Thin Man comes your way. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>